We have Patrick Murphy joining us from Lithuania and Eric Koonsman from Rochester, New York. Uh, both will be talking about, well, Patrick will be talking about his book, Reserve Mr. Memory, and Eric will be talking about his series of books, Fake News, um, which could be more relevant today than we had thought when we set up this date. But for those of you new to book talk, it's very informal. We'll let each of the guests talk for 10 or 15 minutes. Please let them do their talk. Then we'll have a section for questions. Um, we do ask in the, during the talks, you turn off your mics so we don't get extraneous noises interrupting like doorbells and dogs and children. Um, but other than that, I think, well, this is being recorded. So if you have an issue with this recording, um, the book talk, just don't talk. <laughs> um, and we will post it on YouTube and on our website. Um, so with that, I think we'll pass it over to Patrick and let him get going. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. My screenshot says William Murphy, but I go by my middle name. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my book, Reserved Mr. Memory. Um, I'm an American, but I've lived overseas for 26 years now, the last eight years in Lithuania and the previous 18 years in Russia. And the pictures in this book were all taken in the Southern United States, which is where I am originally from. And they were taken over a 50 year period, literally, from when I was a kid with my first SLR until a couple of years ago. And there are 61 color pictures in the book and 59 of them are film, two are digital. And I began putting the book together a few years ago after I moved to Lithuania, I began to get reunited with my photo archives, which had remained behind in the US when I moved overseas in 1994. And I had brought some pictures to Russia and then to Lithuania, but mainly I didn't have them with me until a few years ago. And then I began working with an experienced book designer and a very good pre-press guy on putting together a book. And so I thought what I would do is just, if I can make the screen share feature work, because Zoom is rather new to me, I'm going to run through some of the pictures from the book without much voiceover commentary, and then I'll take questions after you've seen some of what's in the book. So. Um, let me get the, wait just a second. Um, okay. Let's see if I can make this work right. Okay, that's the front cover of the book. Are the little images of you guys along the right obscuring part of the image? Okay. About half of the photos in the book were made in the state of Mississippi, where my grandparents lived, and the other half were made in other southern states where I lived or worked or traveled. No spitting on flowers. It's a promotion for Hostess Twinkies.
The kid on the left has a Confederate flag beach towel. It's a coyote. Those are locusts or cicadas. It's, it's one coming out of its shell. And that picture was made in uh, Montgomery, Alabama on the way to Hank Williams's grave. New Orleans, you would not see such advertising anymore. Obviously, that's a, a historical artifact now. That's the picture that gives the book its name. That was taken on a parking lot in Montgomery, Alabama in January of 1977. And the text in the book gives a little story about the person that was with me when I took the picture and some other background. When I saw this sign on the parking lot. I was struck by it. I had never heard memory as a surname. And I assumed this was a parking spot reserved for somebody who had the last name memory. And it just struck me as such an odd name. I just had to photograph the sign. Well, after the book was published, an art critic friend of mine in New York City congratulated me on having slyly worked a reference to Alfred Hitchcock into the book and went on about how there were some Hitchcockian themes and so on. I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. Well, it turns out there's an early Alfred Hitchcock film which features a character who performs feats of memory on stage under the name Mr. Memory. And my friend assumed that I was aware of that I had no idea that the film existed. And at the time I took the picture, I had no idea the film existed. And I don't know whether the person that put the sign up in the parking lot was making a reference to the Alfred Hitchcock film or whether there really was a person who worked in a nearby building whose last name was Memory. I'll never know probably, but that's just a little sideline about that image. And I had another guy over here in Lithuania, art critic type guy, who thought that this picture of this Waffle House, because of the fallen off letters to the right, he thought that I was making a pun on the word awful, that I was describing that something was awful. No, it just happened that the letters weren't there when I took the picture. But anyway, that's the end of the ones that I'm gonna show today. And I'm gonna stop sharing and I would take questions now. Did you make the book for your own personal use or are you actually, uh, is it uh, being sold commercially? Well, I went into it with the idea that even if I were not able to sell any, that I wanted to do it anyway. I wanted to rescue the pictures from their little Kodak yellow slide boxes in most cases. And I see that Eric, who's in Rochester, the home of Kodak is wearing a Kodak yellow shirt. But I had a lot of pictures that weren't being seen, hadn't seen the light of day in many years. And I just wanted to get them into a tangible form where people could see them. And then if I could also sell copies of the book, that would be a plus. Uh, book sales have been very slow, to be quite frank. 
I came to the US in February and I had some speaking engagements set up, including at some good bookstores. And I had some additional speakers who were gonna be at some of those events. And then the virus, you know, threw a monkey wrench into that. And so those events didn't occur. Um, I was hoping to do some networking at those events and to maybe find a gallery in the US that would be interested in showing some of the images. I've shown the book and some of the images at several venues in Lithuania and in Poland, and I'm continuing to try to do that. And I'm not sure whether he's still on the call right now, but there's a guy's name that I can see now, Max Zildsov, and he has, yeah, he's there. This is actually the first Maybe. time I've seen Max. He and I have corresponded. He listed my book for sale on his website called The Fuchs, and I'll put a link to that in the chat portion of this thing. Uh, but Max has a very sophisticated website that I can tell is a labor of love in which he is promoting independently published photo books and zines. Um, and the book is available through the sales order link on his website. And it's also available from the one bookstore that I did get to do a presentation at before the virus struck. And that's a bookstore in Jackson, Mississippi called Lemuria, L-E-M-U-R-I-A. They have a link so you can order this book from their website, Lemuria Books in Jackson. I'll put that in the chat as well. And then I've sold copies here and there. Um, and I've also gotten pleasure out of giving copies to people who are either pictured in the book or some of whose relatives were pictured in the book. Uh, a lot of the people in the book are long since dead, um, but some are still alive. And, um, you know, I'm really more interested in kind of interpersonal contact with people and putting an actual physical copy of a book into someone's hands. I mean, I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity for this virtual contact with all of you today. But um, Max asked me a question for an interview that he did with me for his website. Uh, is there something you don't like about photography? And I said, well, I don't really like how the photographic image has sort of been devalued. We've got so many images flooding the world these days. It's harder to appreciate any single image. And um, I don't know. I, I basically spared no expense when I had this book printed. Um, it's on really fine quality art paper. Uh, it weighs a little over a kilogram. Um, there's a technique that I, I didn't know too much about book production before this, but each image is individually sort of lacquered. There's an additional layer of a reflective material over the area of the photograph on the page and that cost extra, but I saw the difference with and without, and there's just a little more depth to the photo with that additional layer of finish over the photo. And um, I was really quite pleased with how the design came out. There's like maybe one flaw in the layout that crept in, but other than that, I was pretty pleased. And uh, I mean, Lithuania has a long history of accomplishment in photography, and they have a lot of really top flight designers and photographers and printing operations over here. So I think I did well to have it printed here. I intended actually to list the book on Amazon and I started down that road, but before I could actually finalize the listing, they suspended it because I couldn't provide them with a utility bill from a US address that was less than three months old. Well, I've been living overseas 26 years. I was using a relative's address, but I don't get utility bills to that relative's address. So Amazon wouldn't list the book for sale. And I haven't really gone to the mat to try to get it on Amazon yet, um, but I am gonna try to keep making contacts through places like the Southeast Center and Max's website and personal contacts. And uh, if the virus will end, I actually was uh, accepted for an event that's held every year in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a portfolio review called Santa Fe Review. And I would have been at that next month, but they postponed it for a year because of the virus. And I was sorry that was postponed because I was gonna try to 
network with people there and get the book into some venues where more people might see it. But, um, you know, it was a labor of love. I don't regret doing it at all, even though I haven't sold very many copies. And, um, you know, uh, I might I even do another book down the road. Who knows? Yep. I had a question for you. Sure. Um, so I, I noticed that there is uh, some resemblance uh, in uh, content and uh, to uh, some of uh, uh, William Eggleston's work, uh, but it's not not quite as colorful. Um, and I think the third third or fourth photo you had were two women sitting together, which reminds me of uh, his photo done in uh, in Mississippi. Uh, it's it's pretty iconic for his work. And I was wondering if if you were influenced at, at, at all uh, by Eggleston. Well. Thanks for that question, and you're not the first one to ask it. Uh, I had seen the book William Eggleston's Guide when it came out. I had seen it, and I remember at the time thinking, he and I have been photographing some of the very same parts of the state of Mississippi and maybe some of the same neighborhoods of Memphis. And I think the similarity is really more a product of what we were taking pictures of because of the fact that we both happened to be in those places. I never set out to copy him. Um, well, I, I wasn't suggesting you were yeah, copying him, but yeah. you know, well, you have influences. Yeah, I mean, I, I have seen his pictures in the past and greatly admired them. And if someone sees a resemblance or is willing to compare me with him, then I'm flattered. Um, but I think it's that part of North Mississippi, which is mainly where about half of the pictures in this book were taken, it just has a certain visual quality to it. And uh, those two old ladies that I photographed, uh, they were taken, they were sisters of my mother's mother. And uh, that picture was taken in front of the house where my mother's mother died of diphtheria in 1928 or 1929. Um, and, you know, that's just what they looked like. And, uh, but yeah, the, obviously, uh, well, anyway, I, I appreciate your question and where it comes from. And I'm, I'm flattered if there is any seeming resemblance. <laughs> well, I love these images. They're, um, they're very real, they're very intimate, they're, they're bold and quiet at the same time and wonderful everyday scenes. I especially love the one in the kitchen. It's just so authentic and it feels like there's, there's something that's not quite polished about many of the images, you know? You, you, you grabbed it, you took it, you know? And, and I think that adds to the impact of it. And, um, and that uh, you probably heard this one too. There's the one of the uh, looking at the cafe at night that has kind of a hopper feeling to it. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, lovely work. I really like it. And what's the cost of the book and where did you say it's for sale? Um, I'll put it in the chat comments, but, uh, it's available in the U.S. from Lemuria, L-E-M-U-R-I-A Books, which is in Jackson, Mississippi. I priced it at 45 bucks, and it's high quality reproduction. I mean, I could sell a lot of books before I got my money back. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, and also, it's available worldwide from uh, Max Zhiltsov's site called The Fuchs, which it's T H E P H O O K S dot. Is it com? It's either com or net. I, I think it's com. I allow myself to jump in a little bit. Thank you, Patrick, for the intro. And uh, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, all of you uh, guys, yes, I've shared the link uh, to the chat. You can find it there. And the Fuchs is a platform just to support like any independently or uh, self-published book. We list them for free, then we charge a little commission when the book is sold. 
and so on. And we had a chance, and thank you, Patrick, for sharing your book. We had a chance to get a copy, to review it, and to make some videos, uh, to make some photos of it. Just go there and have a look. Probably you will find something interesting for you. And recently, we have, and we just still today published a short interview with uh, Patrick about his career attitude to tracking and a little bit about this book. A very interesting read. For me, for myself, like uh, we are totally not strict with our policy to accept books to the books. We try to make people enter the market, enter the industry and share their first try. But uh, myself, I'm seeking for um, personal works, I'd say. The works which created made not for commercial purposes or like uh, on the high peak of career probably, but those which were driven like with very, very personal motives. So this book seemed to me from the very beginning when Patrick told me about the book, like a, a real extremely personal lifetime documentary. And I took the, the book as uh, someone said here, these pictures are really represent the real life. They are not staged poses uh, at some point, but at the same time, look like you're in a movie. Uh, I have never been in the US, in that part of the US, I'd say, and for me, it's like a huge excursion over there with so much, uh, so, so many interesting details and so on. And now I understand like this will be a little representation of past times like with, with many historical artifacts as Patrick mentioned before. So thanks. I do not I anymore. encourage people to have a look at Max's site. You'll see some real interesting books on there that you might not know about otherwise. I also enjoyed uh, seeing the images. Um, they are really a slice of life without uh, trying to make, maybe trying to make a point, it really gives you a picture of a lifestyle. Um, and as far as the influences, I think all of us as photographers are influenced. I mean, um, every time we put our eye to a in, to the uh, camera and we look at something, we can't help but be influenced by uh, all of the photographs we've looked at throughout our lives and, and the uh, photographers that we've studied and grown to love. So um, uh, I can see, I could compare if I wanted to uh, your work to a lot of different photographers who have photographed in small towns, in uh, rural areas, in uh, who have focused on place. Um, and I think your work stands right up there with them. I think it's uh, it's terrific. I think you would have had a good time at Review Santa Fe. I've been there also. And um, uh, the thing that's great about Review Santa Fe, if I don't know what position any of you are in in terms of photographers, is that uh, you have to be juried in. So all of the people you meet there were juried in. So there's, um, you're meeting a, a much more experienced group of photographers. And uh, of course the view, reviewers are great too. So you would have had a great experience. I'm sorry you missed it. <laughs> well, they said the, uh... It's going to be held next year, so, so I'm planning to attend, uh, you know, a year from next month. Okay, that's great. <laughs> okay. Anybody Pat else have anything for Patrick? Yes, this is Lori. I, I do. I was curious about your process. You had mentioned that you had, of course, a, a, probably an enormous uh, archive. How did you, how did you choose? the I don't know how many photos are, are in the book but how did you go about choosing your images well I'll just briefly address that um, I did look at probably literally thousands of images 
in the process of putting the book together. If not thousands, it was close to it. And I worked with an experienced book designer and something that uh, Rick McCloskey said a month ago at the book talk, he was the one with the book about the Southern California car culture. And he made the comment, he said, you know, you as the photographer have some ideas about what you think will go in the book. And then the, in his case, it was the publisher or maybe the designer said, not everything you want to go in there is really going to work. And that was true with mine as well. I worked with this very experienced book designer, photo book designer, rather young man. And he told me at the outset, he said, you're going to have some images that you're really attached to, but for one reason or another, they're just not going to work in the book. And he was absolutely right about that. And he also, I told him, I've got this huge archive to look through. And he said, well, why don't you submit to me the hundred pictures you want me to choose from, and then we'll narrow it down. There are, there are 61 color pictures and one black and white picture in the book. And we looked at just about half of them today on screen. And the guy asked me to narrow it down to a hundred. And I wait, later went back to him and I said, I can only narrow it down to 200. I just can't get it any less than 200. And we went through them together. And indeed, some of the individual images that I think are among my strongest, he said, no way will we put that in the book. Oh no, that wouldn't fit. And he was right. I, I'm glad I used an experienced book designer and didn't try to do it myself. He, he had a lot of factors that he looked at that wouldn't really even have occurred to me. Uh, and, you know, I relied heavily on his judgment. I got some feedback from another published photographer and some other photographers and some other people. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a give and take. We went through, I don't know, seven or eight different versions of the layout before we finalized it. Uh, but I'm pretty, pretty uh, happy with what we ended up putting in. If I were going to have uh, an exhibition in a gallery, I might offer some additional pictures. Um, some of these have been exhibited before, and some of them were made with, um, you know, medium format film, and they enlarge pretty big, quite nicely. And um, I've even I got the idea from looking at Max's website. I saw some really interesting photographs taken by a photographer in rural Australia. And I thought maybe some other rural photographer, I mean, I'm not really like a rural resident or anything. I haven't even lived in the US for 26 years now, but the pictures reflect that, that part of my life. And maybe to exhibit them jointly with another photographer who also shot rural scenes in whether it be Australia or somewhere else, might eventually work. But anyway, a good book designer can, can help shape your material. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad I found one. Also, so um, thank you for that very um, informative answer. Um, did you bracket it all when you chose your 200? Did you, I don't know how many years over, the, I might've missed it or you might not have mentioned uh, the period of years over which you took all of the photos, but did you bracket by time at all um, in terms of I'm going to cover only these so many years? No, I just, I, I used things taken over my whole lifetime. So these pictures were taken over a 50 year period, literally. And, uh, you know, from, 13 or 14 until recently. And, uh, you know, I was a little surprised how many of them in there were taken when I was that excited kid with his first SLR. There's really, you know, as a proportion of the book, the ones I took during the first year I had that first SLR are probably higher than any other similar, you know, period of time uh, it's a little bit weird to think that maybe you hit your peak when you were 13, but uh, uh, I don't know. There were some, some later images that hold up pretty well, too. But um, now there was no effort to compress time or, or weed out any time period. It was just dictated by what was there visually. Now, there were some, there were some images. Um, you, you guys saw only half of what's in the book. Um, 
There's another picture that has a very prominent Confederate flag in it and a few other pictures that hint at or otherwise depict maybe second class status for blacks or they depict something that has to do with maybe uh, rural poverty or guns, uh, some things. At one point while working this with this designer early on, I said, one thing I don't want to do, I don't want to come up with some kind of a fuzzy, gauzy, romanticized vision of the South. And after he'd looked at enough of my pictures, he said, I don't think you have to worry about that. <laughs> um, Absolutely true. <laughs> but anyway. Thank you. Sure. I, th I just wanted to ask about, uh, I, th I think it's a very intriguing look at that part of the South. I wanted to ask about personal satisfaction in publishing the book. What did you, uh, you want to say in publishing the book? And did you accomplish what you wanted to say with those photos? Yeah, I think I just wanted to say, I was here, I saw these things. I want you to see them too. I mean, that's basically it, you know, kind of like there, there was a, there's a sort of a tribute to the people in the book that are no longer alive. I felt like the people are gone. I, I kept an image of them. I'm going to bring that image out into the world so that other people can see it and know that, that that person existed. There's some text in the book too. And the text is not lengthy, but for me, it was a very important part of the overall project. And, uh, you know, like there's a picture of a real old man with big ears that has a very wrinkled face. And in the book, I have some text about his life and not, not much, but just enough to give a little feel of there was a human being who shared the world with us for a while. He's been dead now since 1973. I'll never forget him. Um, and, you know, so, I feel like I kind of rescued a few people from oblivion to a small extent, to a very small extent by putting this book together. And that gives me some feeling of like I paid a debt to them in some way or something rather than leaving the pictures in a Kodak slide box in a dusty cardboard box that no one would ever see and that might just get thrown on the garbage one day when I'm dead or something there'll be some copies of that book around that somebody will pick up and open and they'll see the picture of that old man and he'll have a brief resurrection for just a minute while somebody's looking at his picture that he wouldn't have ever had if I hadn't done the book. So yeah, there was some satisfaction. Uh, I also made the sort of semi humorous comment a few times that maybe I should think of this book as just like a really expensive business card uh, <laughs> that I could then give to some people at galleries or something, you know, that to interest them in my work. That um, if I don't sell the book, I can at least promote myself with the book. Okay. Okay. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, well, thank you for having me, Michael. And we're going to pass the torch over to Eric and we'll talk about some fake news. All right. I'm going to start by sharing my screen right away. Real quick. Start. All right. So my project, um, fake news, it's fake news, a historic archive of Donald J. Trump presidency. Um, this project is, I tell people all the time, this is not my artwork. Uh, my photography is completely different from this. I, to give you a quick brief background, I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I went through RIT, so I have my photo undergrads are from there. And then the geek side of my printing is from RIT. And then my book art side, my MFA is in book arts and printmaking from University of the Arts in Philly. Um, I was doing that while I was teaching full-time at Mercer County Community College, and I bring that up because I see one of my former students, James LeChamp, who's actually now in South Carolina, is actually here today, so thank you. Um, but really where this project started, um, just so you also realize, 
the books are really meant, I highly doubt people are gonna buy them for themselves, but it's really meant to get into archives and special collections at universities so people can research this in the future. Um, at the same time, making sure everybody has access to it. Uh, right now, volumes one and two are up on fakenewsarchiveproject.com, but I'm working on getting volumes three, four, and five up there, which I just completed, and I'll explain more about that. But that way, anybody has access, no matter um, your, availability of funds. But really where the project comes from is my kids. Uh, my son was six years old during the last election and he was in first grade and we never really talked about politics with them. And then one day we get a note that they're going to run a mock election for the campaign because instead of playing kickball or soccer on the playground, the kids were actually debating Hillary versus Trump. And so after a while, we're like, oh, we didn't realize this was going on. My son never really talked much about it. And we asked him who he was going to vote for. And he said, Trump, and we asked him why. And he said, well, because Hillary's gonna make China great again. I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds way too familiar. Where did you hear that? And he said, on TV. I grew up, again, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, we're Eagles fans. So that next week we were watching the Eagles game. And sure enough, up on the screen comes a very dark advertisement about how Hillary's gonna make China great again. And so what we realized is we had to talk to my son about politics and he was only six years old. And we didn't want to shape him one way or the other. So we just had to let him know about how, what happens with advertisements and different pieces. So I started to try to collect. Initially it was election day. And then I believe inauguration was the next. And I was really capturing CNN at first because that's what was being attacked the most. And all it was really meant to be was certain days. So we can explain to my son and now my daughter exactly what was happening during those times. So here's January 22nd. And so what I've been doing is I realized very quickly to really show what was happening during those moments, I needed to capture more than just CNN. So it then turned into CNN, ABC, Fox, New York Times, and Washington Post. And I would go through that particular order because I wanna make sure it wasn't where, oh, Fox is put on the right-hand side because then it's showing a little bit more of <laughs> my basis where it's left versus right. So that's why, as you'll see as we get to it, and I've been doing this every day. So at first it was intermittent, every once in a while when it's important, and then very quickly by, I'd probably say about spring of 2017, I realized I needed to do it every day. From that point then became multiple times per day, because if you think about the current presidency, no matter where you are in the political spectrum, the media has been changing as rapidly as social media is on a daily basis. So since COVID and the latest presidency and even the impeachment, I have to almost document almost every hour. And so what this collection of books is, it literally serves as an archive of the Donald J. Trump presidency and the discussion of what is fake news. And this is where you really start to see when I realized I needed to capture CNN, ABC, Fox, New York Times, and Washington Post. And what I would do is as I would visit the websites, as it was uh, changing, I would recapture only if something has changed during that time. And if we think about it, fake news is nothing new. Benjamin Franklin actually ran a fake news campaign against Native Americans many, many years ago. So we think about fake news as just being part of his presidency, but there's a lot more to history than that. And that's why I'm trying to document it here. But putting it back on the iPhone is also part of what social media and our instant gratification. And the reason why it started only with headlines is because that's pretty much what 90% of Americans read right now is just the headlines. And as we go through, what I really started to notice was then with COVID and the presidential election, I actually have to go about eight scrolls down and I am capturing all of those scrolls. And the reason, because there's so many headlines with everything going on now. The project was supposed to be only be three volumes, red, white, and blue. Volume one was supposed to, it went from election day to one year after inauguration. Volume two went from one year after inauguration up to 10 days after Mueller report release. And volume three originally was gonna be 10 days after Mueller report release up, up until the next election. Um, once the impeachment hit and COVID, that all went out the window, and you'll see in a few minutes how that's changed quite a bit. But these are some of the things that you start to notice. Who's discussing what? So here we have, everybody else is talking about Notre Dame cathedrals burning down, 
and Fox News is talking about Bernie Sanders and about the idea of wealth tax. So you start to see what the priority is. And my in-laws are very, very far right. Um, I accidentally left volume one and two out during Christmas Eve this year. And my father-in-law goes, what's this? Because we were in my photo book library and I'm like, oh my God, here goes World War III. And he opens and he goes, this is great. He goes, look at the different events. I go, look at, you can see the different news. I'm like, oh my God, if he's getting it, then most people are getting it because he only watches Fox News. Nothing else except maybe once in a while, Syracuse basketball. And so he asked me to bring it for Christmas Day. So I brought Christmas Day. We don't talk politics in that family. And the reason is it just would not be good. And at first, my brother-in-laws were like, oh, look, Fox News is right. Everybody else is wrong. And then my sister-in-laws were like, yeah, right. I'm like, wait a minute. You're Democratic? That's how much of a discussion we never had. So it was pretty interesting here. So these are the volumes. Um, they're currently in exhibition in Rochester, New York right now called Trust But Verify. And I'll show you some installation shots, but it deals with the past, present, and future. There's three artists, including myself. So volume one and two are about 560 pages. Volume three is 1,023 pages. Volume four, 983. Volume five right now is 1,085 pages. And volumes four and five are only two months, but they are two months of news during COVID and then the presidential election. So volume four is literally just March and April. Volume five is May and June. And I'm gonna have to split them up because after doing this, uh, they weigh about 65 pounds each. They're 12 by 18. Oh my God. So that's where they're double boarded because of how heavy the board, the books actually are. It couldn't have a single uh, piece of Davy board for it. And then luckily being at RIT, I'm able to use our UV inkjet machines for all the cover printing on them. So this is just an example of volume one, two, three, four, and five before they're actually in case into the books. And this is where volume five, after it was sewn together, I literally had to jimmy rig the book into the guillotine cutter just to be able to make the final trims. And this shows you I had on the edges, I did not have any extra clearance for maybe even two more pages. It was that tight. So this is showing you volume one. Here's volume one, 526 pages, the date range that it goes through. Here's volume two. I did not take an updated photo of volume three. I got rid of the white stars. It is just a blue volume with red text. And then anything that starts for me, it really seemed that the news started to explode on March 2nd. So anything after March 2nd will be in a black volume just for what's going on in America at this time. And so here's volume five. And here's some installation shots of it at the gallery. So the reason for having the gallery show is really talking about, there's three artists. The first one is about fake history. So they're doing a fake history on society. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then on the other side is, are my five books throughout the gallery where it's about what's going on today. And then uh, an artist from England has deep fake technology on video. Basically what's happening right now in the campaigns, but it's gonna get much worse as the technology progresses. And that's part of it also, this particular exhibition. So that's why we pass present and future. And for me, the entire goal for this is for people to look at it and remember all of the events that we've forgotten. No matter where you are on the political spectrum, I don't care, but we need to be able to have discussions again. Nobody's having discussions because if we're on the left, we're not, we don't even try to understand what the right is believing anymore. If you're on the right, you don't even try to understand what the left or anybody in the middle is understanding. And this is what we have going on today. I mean, we have to address what's happening in Rochester, New York. We, um, here we had Daniel Prude before George Floyd was killed by the police. And now within the last 24 hours with Ruth Ginsburg's death, we also then have Trump, you know, right away saying there's an obligation to immediately fulfill the Supreme Court vacancy. So, and one thing about this, the books, you'll see at the top of these two on the right, they are time stamped. They go in order. I'm not editing them. And that's why there was the importance to put it back on the iPhone was so that you could realize that these are not altered. This is exactly what was happening at that time. 
people get freaked out when they see my battery in the upper right hand corner start to die. Like, it's getting red. It's like, oh my God, it's going to die. It's like, don't worry. It's, it's done. It's captured. But this is what we're going to see in the history, how the different channels were talking about the events on the day. And this is the exact same time, CNN versus Fox News and what's being discussed. Um, so here's, again, so this is the actual exhibition. So the uh, shelves are also painted red, white, and blue. And then the other two are black. And in the back here, you can see Bill posters. It's his actual deep fake technology video. He actually has one with Trump. And it's basically him counting through the alphabet is what it is. Um, but it's with his voice. Here's the red, white, and blue. So if, again, for me, the goal of these is to get them into archives and special collections for people to look at them in the future. On the right-hand side, this is the fake society or fake history of society. By the way, do all of you know that Leonardo da Vinci invented photography in 1501? If you look at this brick in the upper left-hand corner, so some of the events are dated since Trump took office 2016 to today. And what was really great was the juxtaposition between the two because somebody would be like, wait, did this happen on this day? But they could go to the books and kind of have a cross-reference. And you can see how massive these books actually are. They're giving gloves to everybody because of COVID. It was um, reduced opening where you had to basically make appointments. And the night of the opening was the first night that there was the police firing on the protesters in Rochester, literally an hour after we left the gallery. And it's within a block and a half. Our car was right next to Martin Luther King Park where the protest was going on. So I'm also using the book to try to, to do things like this, where we're, it's called Fake News Unglued, Rebroadcast News. It was supposed to be in person on June 14th, Flag Day, which is also Trump's birthday. Um, and we were gonna try to have it nationwide where we gave the pages to people and allowed them to rebroadcast what they thought was important. And I'll show you very soon an example of how we did that in two galleries. But if anybody's interested, the idea is I'm giving these pages away. Why? I don't think they belong to me. Yes, I created this archive, but in the end, this belongs to everybody. And what I want people to do is pick the media, the events that they feel are important before the next election and put them back up online. Whether you're left or right, it doesn't matter. We all have different things that are important to our values. And that was the, um, if you're interested in the full talk, it's an hour and 15 minutes where it's a Q and A with the curator. If you go to the YouTube, YouTube and just search for my name, you'll find it. That's what the uh, infographic looks like on YouTube. Two more slides. So this is one of those events. This was at A. Smith Gallery in Johnson City. I took a time lapse. So I gave a quick talk about the project and then I was able to sit back. You can see the pages on the tables. They went through and they either pin them up or use blue tape. They might use blue tape to mark certain things or have Sharpie it. So it was much, much more interactive. And there was a great discussion amongst the people. And this is in Johnson City, just um, west of Austin, Texas. It was also done in Waco, Texas. So I figured, okay, let's try Deep Red Texas first to see if this actually works. And there was a dialogue amongst people. Let me move to the next slide. So no matter what happens, I am done with this project with the next election. If Trump wins, I'm done once it's announced that he's won because there's no need to record the future history for me because this project is taking up too much mentally of myself as well as too much time. And I just can't disconnect from the news. The other part is if Biden wins, I have to go up to inauguration because everything is gonna happen and that will be the end date for that. And this is a quick little video to show you. We all on our iPhones now have the option to go to albums and then people or family. So if you notice who the number one person is on my album of my family, followed by my son, my daughter, my wife, then it's Kim Jong-un, Nancy Pelosi. You just go through, and this is me flipping through my iPhone. So you can see that I basically, everybody in politics and media are now part of my family, according to my iPhone. <laughs> This is another reason why I might have to go into a rehab afterwards, just not to have my phone or after the elections are announced, if you're trying to get a hold of me and for two weeks you can't, it means that I actually threw my phone or locked it in a safe somewhere. So 
but let me stop sharing. Uh, so that's basically overall that project, trying to keep it in within the time. If you're interested, it lives up on fakenewsarchiveproject.com. Um, I say it's disconnected from my own personal photography or normal book artwork, um, where it really is supposed to serve as an archive for future generations. And all the pages, volume one and two are up there now. Three, four, and five will be available soon. Um, so that's pretty much it. So questions? I, I would, uh, not really a question, a comment, if I may. Um, just a, a, a brilliant project. Um, I can't even fathom the work that you put into this. And you had mentioned, you know, mentally it took its toll. Um, I, it's brilliant. Thank you. Luckily, I have my personal photography as my outlet to forget about fake news, which is my payphone series. So that's one good thing. So thank you. Have you shown this to the CEO of the New York Historical Society? They do a lot of stuff on politics and their archives there, their library is fabulous. No, I have not. Um, literally, and the other reason for that is because this is still ongoing. Um, it's, it's constantly evolving. So you said New York. Historical the New York Historical Society. And if you've never gone there, the next time you go into Manhattan, it's ne it's the it's the next block down from the dinosaurs. It's an amazing museum. So I do a lot yeah, on politics. I, when I get down to New York City next, which is uh, who knows when that'll be. Plus, we're uh, we're closer to Canada, thank goodness, than New York City at this point. Um, but with that in mind, no, I'm definitely once it's done, gonna start trying to promote it more that way. And the reason is, the project keeps evolving. Just like when I dropped it off at Roco, I'm like, you know what? Even though volumes four and five, they really show, they emphasize a lot by being a thousand pages. Surely having an archive, I need to separate it because there's only so long that that binding will last um, because it's so many pages and so large. I need to make sure it's more practical to stay in archive for the future. So that's my next goal is to slowly start pushing it out there and then people know it is still going on though. How many exact volumes? I think it's gonna be between eight and 10, but it might grow if I separate out every month, so. But thank you for that. Have you, um, similarly, have you uh, made this, uh, made uh, the Pointer Institute aware of your work? No, literally it is um, been just doing this and I had that exhibition coming up and I'm more focused on at this time, trying to get people to help with this event in October because I just feel like that's what I need to do before the next election right. personally. And that's been my sole focus is just doing this and then trying to get it out there. I mean, even the pages for the last 48 hours are going to be incredible to see. Not that people need to be reminded about it before the election, but the bait and switch, we have forgotten about so much. And that's been my, uh, my focus up until now. This so also reminds me a little bit of um, the museum. It's closed now, but um, every day they had front pages from around the country. Exactly. Yeah, the museum, um, when 9-11 hit with my photo students at RIT, we had collected about 84 uh, newspapers from around the world because that was our way of like, what are we going to do in class? We can't talk about F-stops and shutter speed. So we talked about how photo and video would influence that day. So. The event in October that you're putting together, um, can you talk a little bit more about that and how to get involved? Yeah, really, it, the way to, what we're, I'm going to do is the pages are going to be available to anybody to download um, for a web size because otherwise it'd be too large. But with that, what we're going to do is you download the PDFs now because we can't do it in person. And you can take it, there'll be an instruction sheet for everybody. You take the PDF, you find the pages that you like, you can then open it in Photoshop just open those pages and then save them out as JPEG. And then all I'm asking people to do is start to post it on their own social media or get other people involved. Um, other professors from different universities, what they're gonna do is get their students involved. And so the more news that we put out there and start hashtagging fakenewsarchiveproject.com, let alone fake news, and I have a set of about 15 hashtags, so we can start to just overtake social media to put it back in front of people's faces. So I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible where you simply download the PDF for free. 
and then teach people how to do that, where they find the pages that they think are important, open in Photoshop, open those pages only, and then save out those JPEGs. Because otherwise there'd be so many JPEGs you'd have to sort through on my website, the Fake News Archive Project website. So trying to make it as simple as possible. If anybody has any ideas for making it simpler, please let me know. Um, so I stated the other night is because of doing this every day and my personal projects, I'm at the point of burnout on it. And so that's where I'm really looking for other people to help with this portion of just getting this news out to individuals. Uh, my email is just, I'll put it in the chat. It's just eric at erickunzman.com. And you can also up online at the fake news archive project.com. I had to take down the email address because of all the lovely email I was getting from people. So there is only contact form, but I just put my personal email in the chat. So if you're interested, if you have other ideas and by all means, it doesn't have to be that rigid. If you have a different approach for putting it up on social media, I'm open to anything as long as we're getting this information back in front of the public. That's all that matters to me. Also the archives museum in um, DC would likely be interested. Yeah, and that's where, uh, luckily, a lot of universities, because I started showing this, uh, Baylor University was about to buy right before COVID. So if you have any ideas, because yeah, later on, I want to make sure people can come back and research this, because it's not my opinion. They need to see what's happened with how the media has been controlled. The Smithsonian has a political department. Yep. And, um, and I think they would love this. I mean, they're, you know, they're always putting out collecting things and they would love this. It would be a perfect exhibit in that museum. Take a look at that. I had a question about the, the layout. Um, did you, those weren't screenshots. Did, did you have more than one phone or how did you do the layout of it? So they're, they're actually, um, let me go back. Show the screen real quick. So they are actually screenshots. And then what I had to do with those screenshots is go back and place them over underneath each iPhone. So currently up through June, 2020, there's 4,000 pages. And typically each page has six iPhones. So there's about 24,000 screenshots at this time. Um, so I had one of my assistants and an intern from RIT helping me out with that also because it's just repetitive. We've set it up with an InDesign where we almost easily drag and drop and then we change the order, what's in front and back. So yeah, these are actually all individual screenshots. They're not actually photographs of the iPhone. But the reason for putting that back on there is for people to understand that this is not being altered at all. Um, the actual screenshots will be archived as well. So if anybody ever wants to challenge or something was changed, well, here's the original PNG with the timestamp. You can see that nothing's been altered. Um, but that's just been my approach for this particular one is to put them back all back. And you can see I went from an iPhone, I think, 7 to the iPhone 10, and that changes during the project also. Thank you. Yep. So it's been a lot of fun. No wasted time at all making this. Anybody else? Um, I just was going to say I admire your commitment to uh, sticking it out as the project grew to, you know, what had to be some days overwhelming proportions. Yeah, I've been done with this project for about nine months. I think Dave, thank you for coming, Dave. And we've actually talked about it. You knew about the original event that was planned and then everything. Right. It's also just being flexible with everything that's going on because the world's changing so quickly. Um, and I've been done this for about nine, right? No, not nine months. Basically, mid-April with COVID. I just didn't want to do it anymore, but I just, I had to finish it. So that's why no matter what, I'm done after this election. So, but thank you. Do you, have you recruited somebody to uh, take on the next four years? No. Whatever they may be? No, no, no. Just I don't even want to hand it off to somebody. <laughs> no, I don't even want to think about that. I hope they're, um, we don't need another four years. That's just my personal take on it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can't even talk about it. Let's just put it that way. I get tongue twisted because I'm just done. So. 
Yeah, I can I can understand that. I reach I reach my tolerance on social media very quickly yep. because it's it's not it's a great way to put out information, but it is not a platform to have a meaningful discussion on really anything at all. Nope. Yeah, no, that's hard part. And that's oh, the only thing I did forget to mention. I people always ask, "What about Trump's tweets?" The only time I've included Trump's tweets would be Volume Three when it was impeachment, and the reason why I look at it is that was directly affecting him, so that was his defense. I refuse to put any of them in for COVID or the election just because of everything that's going on. Um, so the only time you will see in these books where there are tweets is the impeachment because that was, as I said directly correlating to him. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not news in the traditional sense in that it's strictly personal opinion. There's no, no filter. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I'll add to that. I think the world would be a whole lot better off if nobody paid any attention to his tweets. We've been trying to say that, and that's why since everybody has been. That's why I figured I wanted to document it, so. Yeah. And if anybody else has other ideas on where to place it or other people that might be interested in the social media, trying to get it back in front. And we all know it's, like you said, my in-laws, it's been amazing how they are, my father only watches Fox News, but we can have a discussion around the books and the events. It's pretty amazing that we need that kind of as a barrier or a buffer to allow us to have discussion. So. Hour of the printed words. And by having them all together, you can't argue that it's fake news. It becomes the events. So, I was going to mention um, Vanderbilt University in Nashville has, you know, their massive TV news archive. They would probably be extremely interested, I would think. All right. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have anything for Eric? If not, we'll wrap up for the day. Exciting project. Thank you, Max, for joining us today. Um, Eric and Patrick, thank you for joining us today. Both of your projects are quite well received with our group. Um, so keep it up. And I know I'll be talking to both of you in the future about other things. All right. Um, next month, which happens to be October 17th, we have Fran Foreman uh, and her newest book, The Rest Between Two Notes, and Anne Barry will be talking about her 21st edition's um, book of primates. So hopefully you can join us next month because that's going to be a pretty good, pretty good day with those two and those two projects. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next month. Okay, thank just wanted you. to say that uh, the, Ann, the Ann Berry um, uh, talk will be excellent, I'm sure. She's, yeah. she's, she's really good. Thanks a lot to see, to see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you, another excellent session. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Thanks, Max.